Uh, we uh, began three weeks ago with the first five centuries from the Acts of the Apostles uh, right on through. Um, we uh, recognize that all of the texts of New Testament and the affirmation of the Old Testament uh, scriptures were uh, put written before the end of the first century and then affirmed as we went through those first few centuries. We covered the persecutions and the rapid expansion of the church throughout the Mediterranean and beyond up until the key event of the Emperor Constantine being converted to Christianity and, and calling Christianity the religion of the empire in 312 AD. A dramatic change from the upper room 120 uh, to the Emperor Constantine's proclamation. And he set the tone and an ability to bring together the councils at the end of this time period to be able to affirm the basics of Christian doctrine and affirm the scriptures that were um, obviously used in the church as inspired scripture. As you think ahead, that could not have happened in the Middle Ages because the church was splintering and going all different directions. It could not have happened after the Reformation because the church was splintering and going all different directions. So the Holy Spirit used this time period right after the time of Christ to be able to solidify the key doctrines of our faith, the creeds that really, even to this day, will spell out uh, the doctrines that we follow. We then moved into the Middle Ages. Uh, the Middle Ages, uh, we sort of talked about the rise and the fall. It was uh, the rise and the fall of the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, up to the point where at one point uh, there's this confusion and mixture of uh, both um, religious and secular power. At one point, it is the Pope who is over all things. Tremendous power in the Catholic Church. But about the middle of this time period, there's a slow shift that's starting to take. There's corruption that takes place, the Crusades and some of these things, uh, corruption doctrinally. And by the end of this time period, we have just the opposite happening. The secular uh, monarchs are fighting against the Roman Church and the Roman church is filled with all kinds of abuses and problems. In the East, we pointed out that the Eastern Orthodox Church split from the West with the move of Islam into the Mediterranean. The Eastern Church was forced up to the East and to the North, into the area of Moscow. And uh, we get to the very end of this time and all the seeds of reform have been sown and ready for uh, the next uh, Reformation point out through all of this time period, the Lord has a remnant. And the miracle is, is that the true faith, the, the scriptures themselves have endured through this time. People have been faithful to the truth of the gospel and uh, the Lord's going to use them as we move forward. We moved into the time of the Reformation and the Protestants, uh, these major um, players in terms of uh, uh, the Reformation, uh, I, I was corrected. Uh, Zwingli was probably not officially an Anabaptist, but his teaching in Switzerland led to the movement of the Anabaptists. Um, and I also misquoted Pascal last week briefly, so just, I'm, you know, if you catch mistakes, please tell me. <coughs> um, but we saw these reformers and Protestants that uh, moved out in the Reformation. We also pointed out some of the cultural things that were happening at that time. The printing press, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and we talked about some of the effects of that. We'll summarize some of that in, in a few moments. And how all of these reforms and all of these different uh, sects and groups then make their way across the pond into the colonies and how they begin to be established as the American uh, culture evolves and the nation is formed and the awakenings that take place amongst these different groups uh, in America all the way up to 1850 and the time of the Civil War. So I, I did that quickly because you've been here and you've seen the, the things, you, you all know this now. Um, so we've gone through that, right? <laughs> all right, those are the highlights. Those are the highlights. Now I'll, I'll try to slow down a little bit. We come now to 1850. Uh, and um, we're, we're going to focus on the United States, even though we will talk some about how Christianity is going to spread around the world. We noticed that during the end of the, of the Reformation period, Catholic faith is spreading by the Jesuit missionaries and Dominicans that are going with the uh, conquistadors around the world. 
But in this time period, there will be an expansion of Protestant Christianity around the world that we'll talk about. But we will focus mostly on what's happening uh, here in the United States. <clears throat> One of the major changes that I want to point out at the end of this time period is we recognize that after the time of the Reformation, Christendom, where the state and the church are together and everybody in a region is of the same religion, Christendom of, the, of Europe is forever shattered. And now there begin to develop nations where we use the term pluralism, where people of different religions live together, even though there are different religions in the same nation state uh, or, or country. And that's a kind of new concept. America is the petri dish for that, uh, for that kind of a separation of church and state. Now, <clears throat> I made the point, and I'll, I'll say this again, the underpinnings of our country, without, a, without question, uh, are Judeo-Christian values, the language that's used, uh, some of the references to scripture that you see. Um, many of our uh, founding fathers and mothers were Christians, had that Christian background. Uh, many of the documents that form our country have that background, even though they weren't all Christians. And the nation was never established as a Christian nation. Uh, because there's the separation of church and state. There are those who wanted it to be a Christian nation and still want to try to do that, but that's not the way it was originally formed. And I uh, pointed out that, that that's important to understand. The atmosphere in which our country was founded, all of these different denominations have the freedom to be able to uh, follow their faith and their commitments. I reiterate that because those differences... And those challenges and all of those groups of people in one place are going to challenge the definition of the word united in the United States. And this next hundred years, I've entitled The Great Divides for a reason. And that's where we're going to pick it up, uh, The Great Divides. And my application question for tonight to think through is that, can you name them? Some of the great divides in history, culture, religion, that have drawn lines during this time period that affect us to this day. That's what we want to accomplish going through the details this evening. So let's pray. I think we should do that. And then we'll dive into the next time period. Lord, thank you for the um, demonstration of uh, your character and your person in creation. We see it every day, even with the change of seasons, there's a reminders of how you're in charge of the big picture. And uh, you have revealed yourself that way and then revealed yourself in your word, which endures to this day and will endure. And then ultimately we revealed yourself in Christ and we can know who you are because you have, you have come to us to reveal the truth of the eternal God in person. We thank you for that revelation. We want to be true to it as we again look at history and understand your work by your spirit. We ask that you'd be with us tonight as we talk through these things and find the things for each person that will be beneficial as we live for you in this day and age. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, that's enough review. Let's dive into the next 100 years. We'll start with the Civil War. Civil War, of course, is the great American divide. And as it relates to church history, the Civil War period, this time period, is infused with every form of faithful Christianity, vague Christianity, flawed Christianity, non-Christian Christianity, and non-Christianity. <laughs> Everything is present in this. There was preaching in the North and the South that slavery was God's will and God's design and that abolition is God's will and God's design. And some of the things that were preached by Baptist preachers, I pick on them because I used to be one. Um, in the South, some of the things they said are horrifying to hear today. Teicher, a Baptist preacher, said that slavery is sanctioned in the Bible scarcely admits of a doubt. 
We're fighting to maintain the heaven-ordained supremacy of the white man over the inferior colored race. That's the kind of preaching that we're talking about. People standing up in the pulpit to arms, let us kill, let us destroy, let us by faith, obedience, and love so encourage the Lord of hosts on our side that he will fight for us to destroy the enemy, the north. I mean, that, I mean that's the kind of thing. Now, there's equally strong preaching in the north against slavery. There are churches of the anti-slavery society we have the founding of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and other Baptist churches, black churches at this time. Uh, and uh, I mentioned the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin, the book worldwide that demonstrates the faith, the Christian faith of the slave. Frederick Douglass was African-American in the North who was, played a very ambassadorial role even in working with, with Lincoln. And this is what he said about Christianity. I think this is valuable to read. Between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference, so wide that to receive the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. I love the pure, peaceable, impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slaveholding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial, hypocritical Christianity of this land. Now, the reason I read that is because this divide of the nation of the Civil War is also equally a divide of Christianity. It is as much a Christian divide as it is a national one. The churches are divided in this time period. And I'll go back to the, the timeline at the very top there, top left. This is the division of the Northern and Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, and most other major denominations have similar kinds of divisions that take place at the time of the Civil War, North and South. And that's important to us because our association in Westside comes out of the Northern Baptist Convention. This is going to fit into our history in the next 100 years or so. So recognize that. Abraham Lincoln comes along. I don't know how to describe it. He's a kind of a miracle middleman. <laughs> In his writings, you will not find detailed descriptions of a personal salvation relationship in Jesus Christ. But there's no question in his writing as he grew and as he went along that he had a very deep confidence in the providential involvement of the Almighty God to bring about what is right. And uh, as you know, the Civil War brought freedom, but not equality. And that freedom was limited and not pervasive. And unfortunately, his vice president was a racist from the South, and Reconstruction didn't go as Lincoln might have hoped, and there's Jim Crow and the uh, Civil Rights Movement and everything else. You, but that's another time in history. So that's the Civil War. Again, the Civil War divide is as much a Christian divide as it is a national divide. That's the first divide that we'll talk about tonight. The second divide... Uh, let's go, uh, for the second divide, to the European Enlightenment and liberalism. Go down to the lower left-hand side there. I mentioned last week that over time, uh, after the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the uh, exaltation of the sciences, there began to be a shift in thought over time from a, a, a view of a fallen, sinful man in need of God, confidence in God, to a view of, a positive view of human nature and experience and confidence in man. And a diminishing of the supernatural over this time period. And the birth of our notion of secular science comes out of this time uh, of the Enlightenment. And of course, the most obvious example of that would be Darwinism. This is the time when he writes The Origin of Species in 1859 and The Descent of Man. And evolution sort of fuels the secular idea that's brewing that God is not needed or necessary or does not exist. And you don't need me to explain the impact of this because you know that uh, to, this, to this day. But by the 1920s, 
Um, one historian calls it a meteoric rise of the anti-evolution issue. It was becoming the first concern, the um, central social danger to be eradicated by Christians who wanted to be faithful to the scriptures as they saw it. So uh, we have Darwin at the beginning of this period. By the time we get to the end of this period, it's a huge issue, the issue of evolution. That's on the uh, social scene. In the religious and scholarly realm, uh, it's seen in what is known as higher criticism. Higher criticism is the questioning and rejecting of Bible text origins and eventually the authority of the Bible itself. Darwin was in England. Uh, this higher criticism of the Bible came out of schools in Germany, and it began to undermine every text of Scripture and take it apart and try to go back and redefine the origins of Scripture, uh, eliminating the infallibility or inerrancy that we would say of Scripture and questioning its authority, reducing it to the level of just another book that's kind of nice, to put it simply. And so we have this higher criticism also that has begun to work its way into the churches in Europe, and it's now going to start working its way into the churches in America. It exists to this day. A number of years ago, they had in California something called the Jesus Seminar, where they went back to try to see if there's anything in the Bible that could really tell us about Jesus. They found about four verses in the Gospels that they said were, were legitimate to actually tell us about Jesus. And so this higher criticism and diminishing of the Bible, of course, is real today. The leader of that movement was a guest speaker at a church here in Yakima a number of years ago. And, and so you can see how evolution and higher criticism of the Bible has worked its way into the culture and how, how, how dangerous it can be. At uh, this particular point in time, there was a shift from the authority of Scripture being the foundation of faith to the authority of the experience uh, of the believer and the experiences that we have being the foundations of the Christian faith, a radical change in foundations. And so this begins to produce a divide. Uh, are we going to go that direction in terms of what is going to be called a liberal theology? Uh, or are we going to maintain something that's more orthodox or traditional or let's be begin to use the word conservative, uh, holding on to uh, the truths? That's the first divide. Are those two clear? Any questions about those? Because if you don't have those two things clear, that divide is going to be hard to understand the next 80 years. I, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, I, I'm glad you know them because they still affect us to this day. This is where this all began. And it began to have a tremendous influence in churches uh, in, in Europe, first of all, and then in the United States. Right, the second major divide I want to talk about uh, goes up to uh, what is called the social gospel and the great reversal. The next divide comes uh, around, centers around how do we deal with society? and the needs in society, and uh, some of the uh, challenges that are there. This is the time of the Industrial Revolution. And of course, when you think of that, think of Charles Dickens' London. I mean, think of urban versus rural. Think of uh, the massive wealth that's being brought in, and the abuses, and the poverty, and the conditions for workers. All of that is going on it brought a tremendous need in society uh, for, for people to address some of these uh, basic needs of people. And churches were, were working hard at this. In America, the church is no longer part of the government, officially, and so there began to be many sort of private sector, church denominational efforts to be able to get help to people who were in poverty, who were in need. And there was a great enthusiasm in the churches to do this uh, and progress. Slavery had been uh, eradicated. Uh, the next evil to attack will be alcohol. And a lot of Christians got behind prohibition and, and worked hard on that. My circuit riding great grandfather ran on the prohibition ticket in the South Dakota area. He didn't get elected, but he was all, all for that. Um, they were for women's rights, the right to vote, 
the rights of African Americans. There were a lot of Christians that were very socially active in trying to, to share Jesus with people in very uh, practical ways. Some of these ways uh, were modeled in Europe. If you think of uh, George Mueller and his orphanages and his examples of prayer, if you think of uh, Spur Spurgeon, uh, preacher to the masses, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, this is the time period when William Booth starts the Salvation Army, and that's working in, in England and also uh, in America. So there's the Sunday school movement takes off and comes over from Europe, and they begin to have Sunday schools, which was more than just church education. It was education for many people who didn't have it. So the churches were very, very involved in that. Till about 1900, something begins to happen. And there's another divide. As I said, many of the churches were becoming influenced by this liberal doctrine of evolution and higher criticism and jettisoning some of the major doctrines of the faith that we had established back in the first, second century. And they're setting those things aside. And the, there's an increase of churches that are addressing social needs but that assistance doesn't include salvation in Jesus Christ anymore. That's not really necessary. Let's just get the food or the clothing or let's change the laws or whatever society needs. And there was no longer an emphasis, sometimes it was ignored completely, the importance of salvation in Christ for eternal life, for life and eternal life. And so as this began to happen, it was labeled the social gospel. Because it was basically, as I wrote here, addressing material needs of people without the true gospel. That was no longer the focus of many, many churches. And the social gospel in this form got connected to these liberal churches that were letting go of doctrine. It became associated with liberal theology and modernism and was therefore dangerous. There's a result to that. Because that term, how many of you heard, have heard the term social gospel? All right, that term exists to this day. A couple of years ago, the church I was at in Oregon, we wanted to do some things for homeless. They have a homeless problem there. And we suggested some things, and there was objection because that's social gospel. We can't do that. It, that term and that division between caring for the needs of people and getting the gospel of Jesus Christ to them was seen as a division. And even though many churches were involved in social issues in, at 1900, by 1920, many of the more conservative churches backed away from that. And, and, and that's why historians call it the great reversal. Because they were very involved in society, they pulled away to focus on individual salvation uh, for people. So how do you feel about that? Let's open it up for, the, for a minute. The social gospel... Um, how do you feel about the relationship between the gospel of salvation and meeting the other needs of people? It seems like it's a pendulum. They're going from one extreme to the other. Okay. It's somehow a middle ground. Marvin says like a pendulum. We, we went from one extreme all the way over to the other. What else do you think? Well, I'm looking at it and thinking, well, that must be why... I never heard the gospel because until, because of the social reversal that um, the church that I went to didn't even teach okay. salvation. To, to this day, there are churches that don't include the message of salvation in Christ in the things that they do. Right. Okay, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Doug? Sure, where's, where's the balance? Where's the balance? Anybody else? Yeah, Vicki. It makes me think of um, Jesus' example. Um, because he fed the 5,000 um, and uh, took care of the people's needs. But they right. turned right around and used that as an opportunity to share you know, the truth. He healed them and then forgave their sins. Yeah, yeah? the example of Jesus. 
good, good point. There are plenty of examples. Yeah, anything else, Jackie? Well, I'm wondering about where the Ku Klux Klan fits in on this and where the Masons fit in. I'll have to come back to that. Okay. Um, because that's a, a uniquely Southern culture thing that I'm not quite sure of the origin of. Okay. Uh, but the point of, uh, about the social gospel is, you're right, we've, we've separated them so far. Is there a way to be able to, to do both, or should we do both? This is what Scripture says. Um, James 1, religion uh, that a God and Father accepts, pure and faultless, is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Or how about Acts? You know, the, uh, Peter's involved in, in healing the lame man. It causes a big stir. And Peter, filled with the Spirit, says to rulers of the people, if we're being called to account for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and we're being asked how he was healed, know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed, just as the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Do you see how those things are woven together? The understanding of the need of this lame man, but even right before the rulers, they declare the resurrection of Christ, uh, the crucifixion of Christ, and the importance of salvation in Christ alone. These things, these things can be brought together. Uh, pure and faultless religion inclu includes care for physical needs without self-pollution and kindness to a cripple in Jesus' name and salvation in no other name. These things can go together. And it's amazing how in our history in this country, the reality of the social gospel got connected and the pendulum swung and there are still people that have difficulty understanding how we bring those things back together again and minister to the people's needs in Jesus' name who saved, <laughs> saved their souls. Uh, this is John, 1 John 3. It's how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters if anyone has material possessions, sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Do true and let's not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. All right? So I, I, I took some time in the scripture because that's an example of something now a hundred years ago in our history that's now even impacting us today. Just like evolution, higher criticism, some of those kinds of things and the liberal doctrine that was, uh, that was being formed. Yes? The higher criticism and the social gospel, did that affect the uh, revisions? The, like the English revised version was done in 1885. The American Standard Version was in 1901. It correlates with the, that time period. The time period. Is that in response to some of that, or is that just by chance. It's not all by chance because, you know, there's one example of the Schofield Reference Bible that's very much influenced by these things. Um, so I, I don't know about some of those other versions, but you would have to, it makes sense to look at where those versions come from. Who are the scholars and the people who, who did some of those versions to see what their premises were and the foundations, uh, where their foundations were. So I don't know the details of those versions, but that's a question to ask because there were a lot of things that were affected by these kinds of realities. All right, so that's the, that's the, uh, the social gospel. Concurrent with this, interestingly enough, something that goes right along with this, it's, it's a reaction to these things, but it's also just a shift. We have what we call revivalism. We talked about Charles Finney last week, who was the father of the Second Great Awakening, and the camp meetings that were happening. And the focus of those is personal salvation in Jesus Christ. Do you know the Lord as the one who has forgiven your sins? As we would understand it. There were the holiness conferences that were taking place in, in Europe and in America, the Keswick conferences. They were based upon personal holiness, how you live the faith individually. Revivalism is focused on, many times, the individual. D.L. Moody comes along at this time, and you know some of his uh, crusades that he would have. And he's calling in people to, to faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
Revivalism doesn't focus on trying to change the society. It focuses on trying to change the hearts of the individual, which will change the society. And so revivalism uh, begins at this time. And there's some of the revivalists who want to get away from all of this controversy. And they don't even want to mess with the theological business. Billy Sunday, who is kind of a flamboyant sort of um, revivalist, he says, I don't know any more about theology than a jackrabbit knows about ping pong, but I'm on my way to glory. Do you know Jesus? Okay? So that's, that was kind of the way he went about things. There's a movement to say, let's, let's talk about individual salvation. And it's concurrent with this shift in how the world deals with, uh, with society. This is the time period. Um, the Azusa Street um, revival in Los Angeles, that's when Pentecostalism is born, and the Assemblies of God Church, and the Foursquare Church, the Church of the Nazarene comes out of that holiness movement. All of that is at this time period in the first 20 years of the 1900s. Again, uh, that kind of individual uh, focus uh, at this time period. One of the outcomes of this, which is, we would say is a, a very good thing, uh, is the reality of uh, an increase in world missions. All right, so with this focus of D.L. Moody, with revivalism, with people uh, focusing on salvation in Christ, because the mainline, or the, the more liberal churches, mainline's kind of an adjective to describe the liberal churches, um, they're letting go of the importance of salvation. But a counter to this are people that are going now all over the world with the message of Christ. And I'm going I'm to give you a list of names, and some of them you're going to know, and recognize. This is the time of Adoniram Judson, who in the uh, mid-1800s goes to Burma and India and Burma. David Livingstone goes to Africa. Uh, Hudson Taylor, in the founding of the China Inland Mission, is in the 1860s. One historian, Ruth Tucker, says, no other missionary in 19th century since the Apostle Paul has had a wider vision and has carried out a more systematized plan of evangelizing a broad geographical area than Hudson Taylor. Many of the missionaries were seen as people from the West. Hudson Taylor changed his hairstyle, he changed his clothing, he changed his language, he learned the, the Chinese language to be able to bring the gospel to those people in their culture. And it meant something to them. And so that, again, just another example. Noted women, uh, Amy Carmichael in Japan and India. Lottie Moon goes to China. There was something in the uh, New England area called the Student Volunteer Movement. It began in the 1880s. In 50 years, 20,500 young people left primarily North America for the mission field. Just astounding uh, call to get the gospel to the nations. Almost every single denomination had their mission agencies formed at this time. This is the time of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, the Sudan Interior Mission, the Africa Inland Mission. Cam Townsend went to um, Central America and by 1942 founded Wycliffe Bible Translators. And I, I list those quickly, but can you see just how there's an explosion of let's get this gospel message to the world now. And this just isn't Jesuit you know, priests that are going along with, uh, you know, with Columbus or, or the conquistador. Now we, we've got Protestant missionaries that are taking the gospel. And it's important to mention them and to recognize the calling, the example, their sacrifice. Some, some of them were martyrs. The vision for evangelization, that's the foundation for us today. We look back to some of these folks and their example and the establishment of these missions uh, that still are doing work. Interestingly enough, when we uh, think about the balance between the gospel and meeting people's needs, these missionaries knew how to do that because they would go and provide literature and food and clothing and um, medicine. Very often they would go as medical um, missionaries, education, as they shared the gospel and brought the gospel to uh, the nations. 
the 40s, you learned all about these people. Yeah, Sharon says, if you were going to Sunday school in the 40s, you learned about all these people. Um, grew up with these names. And they, again, they have set examples Maybe be even good for us in this day and age in America to think more like missionaries, the way they, they behaved. Okay, so <clears throat> let's summarize for a minute, okay? Let's, let's <clears throat> 1900. About 1900, you notice there begins to be an us versus them. There are divisions that are taking place in every major uh, uh, denomination in America, Europe now and in America, in Protestantism. Liberal theology, uh, Darwinianism, high criticism uh, is affecting Christian doctrine and practice everywhere. But within every single one of these denominations, there's pushback. There's resistance to this. Well, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Why are we throwing out the things that are most important? And so there's this, this pushback that is, is happening as well. People who still hold on to the reliability and the authority of the Bible. People who still hold on to personal salvation and Jesus Christ, the atonement. And that is the key to virtue in this life and eternal life. And so there's this pushback. In what we can now call the mainline Protestant denominations, they're beginning to assimilate all of that modernism, that culture that has now permeated uh, Western Europe and has moved across uh, into America. Reinhold Niebuhr describes it now this way. He says, we were given by the liberal uh, Protestant mainline a God without wrath who brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. It was the elimination of the idea of the wrath of God, sin, we're not going to talk about sin or judgment, and uh, Christ was a good man. Uh, we don't focus on salvation or the atonement of the cross. That was his evaluation of what was happening at this time period. <clears throat> By the 1920s, all right, past 1990. 1900. By the 1920s, you've got this sort of liberal side, modernist, humanist growing. You've got, and I'm using the word conservative, not in a political sense, okay? <laughs> liberal doctrine, conservative, fundamental doctrine. These people on the conservative side, it seemed to them that the culture in the church was turning away from God. We'll encounter um, William Jennings Bryan a little bit later but he wrote a little pamphlet on the seven questions in dispute. And this is very much the feeling that people were having about the faith, Protestantism in America at this time. And I basically just repeated the words that are on that sketch there, uh, over there on the left. You start with Christianity, but then if the Bible is not infallible, and man is not really in God's image, we're gonna get rid of God creating man now evolution. Uh, there are no miracles, so there's no virgin birth, and we're going to eliminate the deity of Christ, and there's no need for the atonement or the resurrection. We don't have anything supernatural anymore. What you end up with is atheism. And that is the, the direction that the, the nation and the churches of the nation seem to be going to many people. Uh, and so that, you can see the us versus them that begins to develop in this country. All right? Now let's move on because there's more divides. The next divide is other um, religions. If we go back to our chart, the Catholic Church has another council. Basically, all they do is retrench around the same Catholic dogma that was there before the Reformation. Not a lot of changes at this point. This is the time of the birth of the Mormon church, of Mormonism. Joseph Smith lives in the early 1800s, Brigham Young after him, and the pilgrimage of Mormonism from New York to the Midwest to Utah. And by Brigham Young's death, which was in 1877, 
There were 350 Mormon settlements, more than 100,000 Mormons in Utah and the Inner Mountain West. This is before 1900. So that's when this, this all begins. And this is another gospel, to use Paul's term from Galatians. Because instead of just the foundation of the Bible, they add on the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrines and Covenants and what the Apostle in Salt Lake says and their own heart feeling. And they use the same terminology, the same terms, with different foundations and different definitions. So once again, <laughs> you've got the rise now of cults that seem to be going away from the truth. This is the beginning. Uh, and, and by the way, I have noticed in my interaction with Mormons that that seems to be a way to be able to discuss our differences. And you maybe have uh, some things we could maybe share if we have time at the end. But to be able to say, you know, I respect your faith and your sincerity. I re respect your right to believe what you believe. But the truth of the matter is we don't believe the same thing. And we don't define our terms the same way. Your foundations are radically different from our foundations and define the terms a different way. And in my conversations with people, and there have been a, a number, obviously, here in, in this area, that seems to be a way for us to agree that we're different. That it's not the same thing. And... Uh, we can talk more about that, but if you think about how you deal in a pluralistic society with different religions, but understand the truth of the differences, these foundations are critical when it comes to Mormonism. This is the time of the birth of Jehovah's Witness. Uh, the Watchtower Society, where the Father only, Christ is inferior, the Spirit is not uh, a person, uh, and all the other religions are under Satan. Uh, Christian science is born at this time, rejecting the deity of Christ and sin and the material world. So <laughs> not only are there things happening in the, the mainline churches, you've got all these other cults and sects now that are born right at about this time and are gaining inroads in American culture. There's the Civil War. There's theological liberalism. There's a divided response to social needs. There's a divide in the focus of whether or not to look at the society or the individual. And now there's the division of other cults. Here's another one. <laughs> Here's another big one. There's a division about how people begin to see the destiny of humankind. Are we marching to heaven and getting better and better and better to the kingdom of God? Or... Is human history on a path to inevitable judgment before the second coming of Christ? What does the Bible say? This distinction is what's known as the difference between post-millennial and pre-millennial thinking. Okay? I'll take some time on this. Try to make this chart as simple as I could. <laughs> I'm going to show you a chart next, next, uh, next Wednesday that my great-grandfather on my mom's side drew about the end times. He drew one of the big charts that was used. So I like charts. I, I got my degree was in economics. I like charts, OK? <laughs> Try to make this simple. Post-millennialism says the thousand-year reign of Christ is coming, and society is getting better. And we can move people towards that incredible reign of Christ that will come before the second coming. Premillennialism, looking at scripture, says, no, wait a second. <laughs> if you look at what Jesus said in the uh, Olivet Discourse, if you look at what Revelation is talking about, it gives an indication that there's going to be some rough times in the very end. And things are going to just go haywire at the end before Christ comes to end it all and establish his kingdom, however that's defined. Okay. Now, both of these things have their history that goes back to the time of Christ. There are people who espoused two different ideas this way back at that time. But at this particular point in time in history in the church, a man by the name of John Nelson Darby uh, is a reformer in Ireland and in England. And he encourages people to get out of all the denominations and come to join for the breaking of bread uh, on Sunday afternoons. 
And he forms the Plymouth Brethren Movement, which works its way from uh, England and Ireland over to uh, the Americas. And John Nelson Darby also is the collector, but most likely the author of much of what is known as dispensational premillennialism. This is a construct of theology, of theology that looks at all of time and divides it into some very distinct units that do not overlap, of time, eras of time, and divides it up and talks about how God deals in all of these different eras. In particular, was the focus on how he's going to deal at the very end before Christ comes back again. And that's the way he uh, began to publicize this, and it began to be picked up in many of the more conservative areas of the church in America. He is the one who came up with the novel idea that was not known until this time of the pre-tribulation rapture. The idea that the church is going to be raptured out of the world before that time at the end when things go haywire. And he gave it a time period, seven years, before the coming of Christ. And so here's another division <laughs> that begins to develop within uh, the churches. The post-millennialist is saying, okay, things are getting better. We're going to lead, uh, society is going to become more and more Christian. And eventually in the city on the hill, Christ is going to establish his kingdom and return and rule his people. It's an optimistic view. Premillennialism says, you know, there's some optimistic things that can happen along the way as people come to faith, but the end is going to be disastrous when it all comes to an end and Christ then finally returns. Two different views of really the, the end of human, the trajectory of human history and where it's going to end. And that produces uh, a divide most of the people on this side of the liberal theology sort of, well, let's just help things get better. Not focused on what it says in Scripture. Our post-millennial, or maybe the millennium is just any old time, kind of amillennial. That means there isn't really a thousand years. And most of the conservative groups adopt the pre-millennial, even the pre-tribulation idea that the rapture will happen before the final seven years when Christ comes back again. Okay. A thousand questions we could deal with on this, but in principle, overall, big picture, does this make sense? Do you have any questions? Questions aren't bad, Doug. Uh, seven years, God's timeline or man's timeline? Well, the seven years, yeah, is it God's timeline or man's timeline? It depends on how you read the book of Daniel. It depends on how you understand the way he talks and divides up the weeks. And so what, what Darby did and what was done in this is not something that is pulled out of thin air necessarily. It's an interpretation of what some of the scriptures are saying about those time periods. Okay? All right. Yes, Larry. Uh, what was your grandfather's point of view? Did he try to illustrate both sides, or was he definitely on one side? He was definitely on the premillennial side, yeah. I'll show you the chart next. The chart looks like this. It's, it's one that was in front of our church. I grew up in the Plymouth Brethren movement, okay? This is my history. But um, I'll show you the chart. It's one of these, okay? And it stretched from one end of the front of the church to the other. And a whole bunch of churches all over the Midwest back in the... Uh, 30s and 40s. Um, so, yeah, this, was, this became very popular. These prophecy charts and prophecy conferences and all of these kind of things. We'll talk a lot more about those next, next week. Yeah. All right, well, aside from all the pre-tribulation stuff and rapture all that, understand at least the idea of the difference between a post-millennial and a pre-millennial view of human history. And understand this is another divide. This is another thing that's beginning to divide the church. Roger. In, in the previous device you talked about, there really was kind of a separation between believers and unbelievers. The cults are not true believers. And uh, the real liberals who have jettisoned the gospel are not true believers. But when it comes to eschatology, we're really talking about divisions between believers. Is that correct? 
Well, not necessarily. Some of the more mainline or liberal theology would still say that there is a progression towards some kind of goal, uh, that where things are going to get better, and that there may be, you know, in the end, uh, a a kingdom of God. And so, they haven't all completely gone this direction. There's a bunch of them kind of that are still moving that direction. And so there's a lot of people who would call themselves Christians. They say that they're the church of Christ, but they've jettisoned some of these things and they've moved this direction. And so we would look at them and say they're unbelievers, but they would not look at themselves and say they're unbelievers. They would say, we're the Presbyterian church, we're the Baptist church, we're the Methodist church, we're the Lutheran church. And that's why this becomes so complicated. Because who's to judge who is a believer and who isn't? God's going to do that. And yet, you've got to be able to say, well, what is truth and what is not true? What is the core of the gospel? And that's why this became so intense, because we've got to hang on to the core of the gospel. There is a fundamental truth here that must be grasped and told and not jettisoned and let go. On the world stage... There's a few other things that are happening. Minor details, right? We have, um, <laughs> we have uh, the First World War and uh, the Communist Manifesto, which is written at the, uh, in the late, mid eight, late um, 1800s, now begins to affect the Stalinist and communism. There's a Great Depression. There's fascist Nazism. And uh, there's a confessing church. You know, there's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is against it. But we all know the outcome of the Second World War, deadliest military conflict in history. 70 to 80 million people perished, about 3% of the world's population at the time. Nothing (laughs) destroyed the post-millennial confidence in societal progress moving forward like the First World War. And then you look at what happens in the Depression and the Second World War, and that idea that things are getting better and better and better and better, and we're more marching to the kingdom, begins to fade rapidly. And I don't mean to diminish the importance of these events, but we're talking about church history. <laughs> but there's no question that this divides the world in unique ways. And there are Christians and non Christians in different denominations that respond to these wars in different ways. More division. More division. Okay. North and South divide. Theological liberalism divide. Response to social needs divide. Divide on whether you focus on the salvation of society or the individual. The division of cults that call themselves Christian that start to divide off. The divide of the view of human history's end and the divide of global wars and economic depression. So do you agree with my title for this hundred years? <laughs> the divides. All of these various divisions of the Christian faith and church were on display almost as if it was a staged play in the famous Scopes Monkey Trial of 1985, or 1925. Okay, 1925. How many of you have heard of the Scopes Monkey Trial Raise your hands high so I can see, because I know how. Okay. Just briefly, what do you remember about it? William Jennings Bryant okay. challenged. Um, William Jennings Bryant. Yeah. Um, he was the the, um, the lawyer. Right. Yeah. Against Clarence Darrow, right. who was the defense lawyer. Okay. They challenged each other. Names that have become well-known. What else do you remember? Well, there was a teacher in Tennessee, well, I shouldn't know his name, but uh, he was teaching evolution, which was against the state law at that time. In Tennessee. Yeah. His name was Scopes. Right. John Scopes. Right. And there was a law in Tennessee that you couldn't teach evolution. 24-year-old taught evolution, broke the law. Hence the trial. Okay. Prosecution attorney was William Jennings Bryan. And the defense attorney for Scopes was Clarence Darrow. What else do you remember, Jackie? Well, I I remember, I've never heard the Scopes monkey trial, but I I remember Clarence Darrow Mm -hmm. and that that trial. 
and it made, um, I think you noted that here too, it made Christianity look stupid. Right. <clears throat> the prosecutor was uh, a self-determined or self-proclaimed uh, theologian of the Bible, so the defense attorney put him on stand. Yeah, and an interesting thing that happened in the trial is Clarence Darrow put William Jennings Bryan on the stand to get him to testify about his stance on this issue of evolution. Okay, let's, let's, let's kind of get to step the stage here. Obviously, at about this time, there needs to be a way to write down these fundamentals that we're going to hold on to. If, if the mainline churches, we'll call them the liberal churches, are moving away and there's all this kind of you know, groups within these denominations and they're struggling, how would you begin to say, wait a second, no, we're, we're going to define what it is we're going to hold on to. In 1910, a couple of wealthy um, businessmen in, in California subsidized the printing of three million copies of what was called the fundamentals. I got, I got copies of them here. 12 different, 12 different little pamphlets that were mailed to every church, pastor, seminary student, uh, missionary, YMCA, um, Sunday school superintendent all over the country. And what the, the goal was, was to get some of the top writers from the conservative side to go back and define what it is we believe that we're not going to let go of. And it deals with the atonement, the deity of Christ, uh, the authority of Scripture, the reliability of different parts of Scripture, talks about Mormonism and what it really is, deals with higher criticism, goes down through the details of what we would consider, we'll go back to the creeds, <laughs> we would consider the orthodox truths of the faith. Now, I'm not saying that they're all absolutely accurate in everything that's written. Um, but there are some amazing authors here at the time, theologians, who write in such a way to say, at least we're going to hold on to these truths. And these, um, these documents initially didn't make that big of a splash. This is in 1910. By the time you get to 1925, there has been a codification of these fundamentals, the things that were the orthodox truths we're not going to let go of. And at the core of, of all of this, then, is the issue of evolution. I mentioned how that became a flashpoint. And so when this trial comes up, they try to, to make it a, a bigger stage to be able to illustrate the difference between these two sort of competing, really, views of the world, world views now that have developed. William James Bryan was a politician. He ran for president. He was a secretary of state. He was a promoter of prohibition. But later in life, became kind of a figurehead for this movement against evolution. And he was brought in to be the prosecution lawyer in this trial. Um, Brian said, it's better to know the rock of ages than the age of rocks. So <clears throat> he won. He won the case. Um, it's true that uh, Scopes had taught evolution. Later on, that was actually overturned on a technicality. But he won the court case. But in the process, he lost the country. Because Clarence Darrow is a hotshot, you know, liberal lawyer from Chicago who comes down, and he calls Brian a bigoted ignoramus and a dramatic cross-examination of him and just makes him look ridiculous. Fundamentalists were painted as closed-minded, ignorant, belligerent, and separatist. And in a sense, in this trial, it's like two worlds are on display. And it was set up this way. And it was promoted. And it was all, newspapers all across the country knew this. It was sort of the urban modern future versus the rural backward past. It was science versus religion. It was the 20th century versus the 19th century. We're either going forward, like these old codgers, we're going backwards. Brian dies just a few weeks after the trial. He's just wiped out by it. Um, and again, it's not that this particular trial 
had any kind of official influence, but it was made to be so important and it was publicized in such a way that it becomes a picture of the divides that have come in Protestant Christianity in America. These things begin to crystallize. The fundamentals, uh, the liberal theology, it begins to crystallize. And, and this wonderful sort of synthesis that we had after the, second, after the Civil War, where Protestants were working together and things were going to get better now after the horrific Civil War. Now things are divided in the church uh, in this way. And I, I understand that that is a kind of huge generalization. There are all kinds of in-betweens here as we begin to break down the individual denominations, uh, individual people and what they really thought. It's not fair to, to, to just leave it, you know, this, it's all this way. But this is in general terms where we find ourselves as we head into the 1940s and 1950s. Eventually, after that, um, after that trial, Fundamentalism, as a movement, takes a far leap to a, a further direction in the right, becomes very strict and even militant. And there's people that shoot each other, and there's all kinds of crazy things that go on. And, and as a um, characterization, the fundamentalists become smaller in terms of the, the group that's, that's actually would be a fundamentalist. However, there are fundamental realities now that have been articulated in every denomination, in every kind of church. There's these people that are going this direction and those that are pushing back. There are these fundamental principles now that are in the culture and in the churches. And there is a subculture that has now been built that will really produce evangelicalism as we know it in the second half of the 1900s. And today, well, today it's changing again. But at least for the next, next session, next week, we're gonna talk about 1950 to the year 2000. And we're gonna talk about the evangelicalism that emerges out of this kind of background. And the, the, the trial really just sort of illustrates this, this division uh, back on the Timeline. I just illustrated a couple of church, a couple examples here. The United Church of Christ is formed uh, in the 50s. This is the the Congregationalists from New England. Remember back <laughs> the Puritans. Uh, if you go back there, they've sort of taken this shift towards the main line. And then there's CBFMS. Does anybody know what that is? How many people here know? Raise your hand if you know what CBFMS is. Okay, that's what I thought. There's about five people here that knows it, six people that know what that is. That's the Conservative Baptist Foreign Mission Society, which was founded in the Northern Baptist Convention in 1943. And that's the association that we are a part of at Westside. There's a history to that. We'll talk about that uh, next, next week. But the, you've got churches that are going both different directions in every single denomination. Um, just like there was a split at the Civil War, now there's a split um, in terms of doctrine, theology, what we're going to teach, what's the gospel, how are we going to hold on to the truths of Scripture. All right, now, <clears throat> left a little time at the end for you to ask the question, of these divides, of the things that you see here, what, is, what hits you? Just personally, as you think about your, your walk with the Lord, your involvement with the churches or church, your history, what are these things in the last hundred year period really which divide or which thing kind of strikes you as important to you? I know that uh, the, the, social, speak up, speak up. the social gospel influence was, uh, had quite an effect on me in terms of them being the bad guys. And just so in our church, what we're doing, we weren't going to have anything to do with 
giving out food and all that sort of stuff. Right. And it's, you know, it's a bit of a struggle to get over that. Okay, good. Thank you for sharing. Can you tell us what church kind of church you were growing grew up in? Assembly of God Church. Yeah. Did you all hear what Doug was saying? Just the idea of that social gospel label. Um, a lot of us lived with that for a long time. And there was legitimacy to it, but, you know, that balance. Good, thank you. Somebody else? Jackie? It kind of helps me understand my parents because um, I became a Christian in 1971. And when I rushed to tell them, they said, well, you knew that. You knew. You knew that. And I said, no, I didn't. The Methodist Church didn't teach that. Well, well, we're Christians. I said, really? I said, I wouldn't have known that, Mom. Yeah. They were very offended. Interesting. And um, I said, I know you swear and say his name all the time. <laughs> but I've never heard anything else. And they did go to church. But they were so angry with me. You know, we, <clears throat> we just covered 100 years. Yeah, that was just a few. But, but, I mean, these things didn't happen like light switches yeah. on and off. These were influences that infiltrated. And there were churches that had varying degrees of liberal theology and the truth. And, and so there are those who thought that they were still on the right track, but things had seeped in that overtook the truth and changed it over time. So, and there's casualties there. Yes, please. So what strikes me is, you know, Satan is the great deceiver. And he'll take one little nugget of truth and kind of twist it. And it seems like all these divides have been based off of something like that. Like just taking one little something and twisting it just a little bit to get people to divide, which kind of makes me think of, you know, what it says about a, a divided kingdom can't stand. I mean, it seems like it's all intentional. Right, and we see that happening again, the, the kingdom over falls. Over and, over and, yeah. over and, over. and again, I keep wanting to point the finger here. <laughs> Am I going back to what the scripture says? Am I evaluating in terms of what godly people have said? Um, how dogmatic can I actually be? <laughs> I want to, we really want to look at our own to make sure we're not other things seeping in that shouldn't because we're all susceptible to that if we're not submitted to the Spirit. Yeah. Right. So the missions that we were a part of, Mennonite Brethren, they, it was an us versus them. So they did go out in the world, uh, but they didn't, uh, it, was, it was a missions to the world. Uh, when it was done in the United States, uh, they would plant churches, but those people that became believers could not come to the mother church. So, uh, interesting. So, evangelism was okay to the nations, uh, but uh, you couldn't mix the two. So, there would still be, um, there would still be expats meeting together, but you wouldn't have the African church for example, being a part of the expat church. I don't know if that makes sense. So what you're saying is that the missionaries, when they were in the other culture, would gather together as a church, but they wouldn't mix in with the folks, the indigenous, in that area. Right. Interesting. Interesting. And that was Mexico, Africa, yeah. that was all over. Interesting. Does the gospel, is it only for me this way and for you that way, or, for, or is it for us? And what is the kingdom going to look like in, in glory yeah. when every tribe and nation and tongue? Yeah. Sue, you were going to say something on that? So I grew up conservative Baptist, and I love church. And when I was growing up, though, and it, it focused always on teaching, but we would never mix with charismatic churches. <laughs> we, we, it's like... I remember I rode on the school bus with a girl whose dad was a pastor of the Assembly of God Church. And she was really nice and everything, but I was like, well, I wouldn't go visit that church. And I remember one time it was an all city. Oh my gosh. Good timing. 
<laughs> there was an all-city uh, youth thing, and I was nervous about going to that because I might be with Methodists, oh my goodness, <laughs> or with charismatic people, oh my gosh, that's really scary. I mean, and, and I, I can't imagine I was like that, but I was a kid, and we did not not mix and now of course everything's changed. Yes it has. You know, and I have really good friends who are Catholics who love Jesus. And, and know him as their Savior, Christ. that's right. And, you know, so everything's changed. That's my experience as well in the Brethren Church. We, I mean, it got to the point where maybe we're the only ones going to be in heaven, kind of thing, in some some ways, you know. And we would not, we would not mix with all these other denominations until I would go to camp and meet other. When I went away to college, I grew up in Kansas in the little assembly. I went to school at a secular school in California. <laughs> and. Well, I tell you, we've, there was about six of us that found each other. One was Episcopalian, and one was Methodist, and one was some kind of charismatic, and it didn't matter. <laughs> they loved Jesus, and we were the only ones. And, and you realize, you know, how that begins to break down. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, for both of you, for sharing that. Somebody else? Yeah. I'm thinking about the divides and how they affect us today, because... <clears throat> When I got saved, I was 20 years old, totally green, didn't know anything other than confronted with the fact that, you know, I was a sinner and needed salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay, but from that point on, uh, th as we moved through those first few years, we got talked to by Jehovah's Witnesses. We invited Mormons in to visit with us. We went through the Pentecostal movement. We, yeah. I mean, to us, it, any church was the same. We didn't know, didn't know any differences. And so I guess if all those different divides, it, it, uh, we, we at one point we went to Lutheran, to Lutheran church for a right. while. Um, God kind of navigated <laughs> us through all that and brought us out the other side. Well, and how important <laughs> it is that the thing that brings you through, the work of the Spirit through the Word of God, to bring you to what that truth really is. And how much do we need to go back? You know, that's why, that's why Joe and Leah, I mean, they still open the Bible every Sunday morning and make sure that we are trying to understand what we've been shown in, in the Word of God. Yeah. Good. Somebody else? Anybody else want to share? I, don't, I remember, I don't know why, I was raised on the King James Version. Mm -hmm. I never understood why they changed that because I, I understand that. Right. I don't, to me, so many of the new translations are, I don't get it. I mean, I don't feel it as much as I do, and so I still use the mm -hmm. King James. I think there are, is it one of Baptist churches that still does, but Bible Baptist maybe uses um, the King James version, but I don't Sharon's talking about versions that are used, and it's interesting to follow that through. It's another line of, of conversation. I mentioned to you the Schofield Reference Bible. Um, my hope is built on nothing less than Schofield reference and Moody Press, right? <laughs> uh, we'll get to that one next, next week. Um, this, yeah, the Schofield Reference Bible, the references really do deal with a particular aspect of theology. And so you have to kind of look at the different Bibles and translations and where they come from and what is their principle for doing their translation. There is a Jehovah's Witness Bible things have been changed. There, I mean, there are things like that you have to pay careful attention to. That's another conversation. Important. Yes. yes. I, I, I'm just looking at the notes and wonder if you would comment, because this is, this last hundred years is uh, Anglo-American yes. and not really emphasizing uh, mainland Europe, which right. went with the divide and they, haven't, they didn't go through the revivals and all of these different... You know, there was a... There was a um, it, a question that I, some, some theologians, I went to a conference and they were talking about Arminianism versus Reformed, you know, predestination and, and free will and all that big, huge conf con con conflict in the Western church. And he was from India. He was a theologian from India. And he says, well, we don't talk about that at all. We talk about or something like that. You know, it, it's totally different in, in some ways in other parts of the world. And um, so, the question is, how do we really understand all of the church history that now is developing in the rest of the world? So when we get to this time period, up until now, 
we haven't really had Christianity in the rest of the world. And there are little enclaves uh, in little parts of the world, you know, from Thomas I mentioned when he went to India, and little bits like that, the Eastern Orthodox Church. But Christianity exploded with the Jesuits and the conquistadors, and then this time period when Protestant Christianity goes to the world. And so now's the time where you want to start saying, what really is going on in Nigeria? What does the church in South Korea look like? What is the church? I mean, because we know there's been tremendous change there. How about the church in South America? And that's a history that personally, I haven't done a, enough study on, enough research. And so um, we'll talk about some of those as we get into the next couple of, of uh, sessions, the best of my ability. Uh, but the focus that I'm trying to bring to us eventually is for us to talk about here. And I guess it would be important to me if those of you have been overseas and have been in another culture, if you can add some of the things about the growth of the church uh, in other parts of the world. I'm, I'm hoping to ask Elias maybe to give us some time for him to be able to talk about that from his perspective. Joe has a perspective too from his background. Uh, so you're, you're making a great point. And I guess I'm just saying I haven't delved into all of that. And it's not really until this time period where that's even going to produce a lot of conversation. So, thank you for that. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Might be a little bit out of the scope of my ability in this class. <laughs> but it's, it's valid. I mean, let, let, let me add to this and we'll, we'll wrap up with this. At the time of 1850, the vast majority of Christians in the world are in the West. That's not true today. That's not true today. Just let that sink in. It talks about where the gospel is going and what the Lord is doing to bring his own to himself. It's just Washington is one of the church states in the United States. Yeah. I, I moved after I left West Side. I went to Benton County, Oregon. And I did a little research on Benton County. It's the least churched Christian county in the country. <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, Corvallis. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, well, I'll, I'll put up my divides. You can talk about them any way you want to talk about them. But this is the, the summary that I kind of put together, the Civil War divide, uh, the divide of um, faith in the Bible and, and humanism, worldviews, the abuses and responses in culture, uh, the cults and sects, the millennial perspectives, the political philosophies that change and then this, this difference between the liberal conservative theology that divides evangelical and mainline Protestant churches, that's where we're going to pick up next week as we go forward. So thank you for those of you that shared, and, and I appreciate you being here. Let's pray, and we'll go. Lord, as we, I, just going through all these names and talking about all these people, um, our desire is to learn and to, to be more like you and, and to learn how to be Christ-like. Not trying to, to judge or put people down or um, recognize that there are sincere people who are sincerely wrong and they need love. You've loved us that way and uh, we just thank you for that. We want to stick to the truth and I don't claim to always know all of that. We need to be taught so I just pray that as we see the history and the unfolding, that we will learn from those people who have been faithful and true, that we would be faithful and true. We need your spirit to do that in us. And we thank you for your presence with us in Jesus' name. Amen. I have copies of the fundamentals. I also have a book.